And tonight we're going to uh, talk about the persons of the Son and the Holy Spirit in your chapters 13 and 14. Can you know us? I want to begin by just asking, uh, does the New Testament teach that the Son of God was begotten of the Father? Does it matter whether or not the Son was already being whenever the beginning of time and creation was? Why is it just as serious an issue to deny that the Son of God actually became human as it is to deny that He is God? Does the phrase immaculate conception refer to the birth of Jesus? Uh, was the person of Jesus conceived of the Holy Spirit, the person of Jesus? What is meant by the hypostatic union? And how many natures did Jesus have? One last question for now. Does a person have to believe in the virgin birth or conception in order to be saved? We could go on. We could talk about uh, is the filling of the Holy Spirit and the baptism of the Holy Spirit the same thing? Who, who is it that baptizes in the Spirit? Is it Jesus or is it the Holy Spirit himself? And see, tonight we're going to be answering a lot of those questions. And as we do, I think we're going to have another reminder of why it is that a responsible seminary would require Greek of its students, and why you've perhaps already gone through the Greek program or in the middle of it, uh, because we're going to be seeing a lot from that. Um, so there's a lot ahead of us, and uh, these pages, I don't know, have you read it yet? Anybody had a chance to go through it? I'll be honest, okay. No. Uh, well, we start out with the uh, term Son of God, and if you haven't read it yet, there's a little reference there to the Council of Nicaea and some other uh, verse there at the beginning. But we're talking about the word Son as applied to the second person of God. This, is, this study is really an extension of your discussion of the triunity of God, this three in oneness. And in a metaphysical sense, the word Son has various significance. Now, what do I mean by metaphysical? Do we have a handle on that word? Not, not physical. Not physical? It's probably true. I tried to do something etymologically, or I even looked it up in the dictionary. Meta is with or what, after, depending on whether it's with a genitive or accusative in Greek. And physical, we know what that means. But actually, the term instead of, kind of has the idea of being above the physical or in the area of what is as essential or at or um, let's see, abstract, but it has to do with the essential nature of things. Okay, so in the essential nature of the second person of God, what does the, the concept of Son mean? Um, one of the things that it refers to is his pre-incarnate uh, existence, and this is um, this is brought out if you're looking at the notes on the top, bottom of page 135. John 1.14, um, the word which, uh, and by the way, how much Greek have you guys had? Because I'm going to make some reference to Greek, not I want to just be, you've had zero? Zero. Oh, okay. And zero? None, um, yeah. Okay, and very well. Yeah, first two. Okay. That's, uh, okay. So much fat. <laughs> um, I'm off the hook then, right? Yeah. But you know that John 1.1, 1, 1, if you have your English Bible, begins with, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, the Word was God. You come to verse 14 and it says uh, that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And so the, uh, the concept of, of God's, the Son of God's sonship has, has to do with um, uh, the historical sense it says here that is that he existed prior to being made flesh. There's some neat Greek here I was planning to kind of refer to, and that is that um, in, in John 1, if I can find the book of John here, uh, when it begins, in the beginning was the word, it's the imperfect tense, which means that he was in the, it's like looking in past tense but seeing ongoing action. So whenever the beginning was, the Son was already, the, the Word was already being, okay? But when you come to verse 14 and the Word became flesh, it's a different, it's called the aorist tense, timeless tense, and this particular 
use of it has to do with his entrance into a form that he had not had prior to that. So the eternally existing word at a point in time entered into uh, a, a human form in the incarnation. And uh, that's one idea of his sonship, is that it refers to the fact that uh, he was made flesh, or he was begotten in, the, in that sense. Um, there are other passages down there, if you're looking at the notes, that indicate that the Son is divine, uh, such as Hebrews chapter 1. Uh, that's a great one. Uh, various references there. One thing I learned, and, and you'll see it in the notes, is that, uh, well, let's see, let's wait till we get there, I'm sorry. Maybe we should just read that, that last part on page 135. There are other passages which indicate that the Son serves to, that the Son is divine, such as Hebrews chapter 1, and especially verse 8. Somebody uh, have that looked up? Hebrews 1, 8. I can get it. Okay. Uh, but, but the Son said, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever in the scepter of brightness. Okay. And but of the Son, right? Oh, but of the Son, he says. He says. Okay, excuse me. So he's referring to the Son as God, and that's a strong attestation mm -hmm. of the deity of the second person of God, God the Son. And then uh, it says, On occasion, Jesus addressed God as Father, or my Father, rather than our Father. We have that in the very, um, what's called the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6, 9, our Father, which, which are in heaven. But he sometimes refers to him as my Father. And the scriptural ref record gives instances of where the Lord used the term regarding himself. It was correctly understood by his auditors, those listening to him, that he was, he was claiming to be God, to be deity. And there's some references there for that. Another way that the word son is used is in reference to his messiahship or his being anointed. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Uh, he is the designated one to fulfill the prophecies of his promise uh, concerning Israel's messiah. That could only be true, by the way, if he is the son of God, the second person of God, uh, deity uh, with the father. Then the nativistic sense just refers to the fact that uh, Jesus was born, and I think three of, three of the four of us have been right there on the spot where, uh, where it's believed he was born. Pretty exciting. And uh, his humanity, he owes his humanity to the uh, Holy Spirit, and so in that sense is a son. I, I don't know if you have any questions about that metaphysical sense, but just in his very essential nature, as a second person. We're saying that he is pre-incarnate, he is deity, he is messianic, and he owes his human conception to, to God, and in all those ways, he is a son. But then we come to the, uh, the son as a personal being, and uh, we have something very interesting here uh, with regard to his personality. The personality of the second person is indicated in a variety of ways. The terms only begotten and firstborn, which we're going to look at, are used of the second person, are terms that are appropriate for a person only. So they indicate a personal, intimate relationship between the Father and the Son. But uh, if you go on to read here, you, you realize that uh, Jerome, remember him? Remember where he uh, hung out at the underneath the Church of the Nativity? You've probably been where, right where he... How many years? 26 years? Translating the Hebrew and Greek into the Latin Vulgate. When he came to this Greek term, monogenes, uh, he translated it differently in relation to the Son of God than he did any other place that he came across it. Any other place that he came across this Greek word, he translated it only or unique, unicus. But when he came across it in relation to the Son of God, he saw an opportunity, uh, we think, to, uh, to refute the Arian error, Arius uh, being one who denied that. Uh, well, do you know what the Arian error is? I should. We just talked about theology. Yeah. 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 Basically denying that Jesus is what? Oh, Lord. No? It was uh, 
God. Yeah, basically thinking that he had a beginning like we do. He's human. He's, yeah. he's, it's kind of the Jehovah's Witness problem. Yeah. Uh, he is human, but not <clears throat> divine. And so to maybe correct that or to address that, it's thought that Jerome translated this word monogenes as only begotten, because that would show that he wasn't created, but he, he proceeded from the Father in a sense of begotten. Problem is, the, the word monogenes does not come from monogenao, which would be born, uh, or would be the word for born. It comes from the word that means to genus or kind. And so really, uh, it should be translated in our Bibles as the only son or the unique son. Now there's an illustration of this, uh, a number of them in scripture. Was, uh, was Isaac Abraham's only begotten son? Well, he was not his only son, right? Did he have a big brother? Mm -hmm. A guy named Ishmael? Did he have other, other siblings later after uh, Abraham, I don't know if you remember that, but Abraham actually married after Sarah died and had uh, many more children, or at least some more. So Isaac was not the only son, but he was the uniquely begotten, or the, the unique son in that. What was unique about it? The child of promise. His child, he was a child of promise. His conception was miraculous. His birth was uh, God's choice to build the nation of Israel uh, through him. So he is uh, unique, and Jesus, in a somewhat analogous sense, is a is, uh, only begotten, or actually, we should say, unique, or only in that same sense. Uh, then we come to the term prototokos, which has to do with firstborn. And again, that doesn't mean uh, first in a number of people to be born, but rather first in rank or chief. And it has the—it's an honorific title that Jesus uh, has first place in all things. Okay, so if it said prototokos, and we were to understand it as firstborn. Uh, that would suggest that he had a beginning, which he didn't, and that he uh, owes his, his person to, to, to uh, birth, and actually he pre-existed as we've talked about. And uh, we have, a, a, again, this illustrated in the fact that was Isaac the firstborn? No, Ishmael was, but Isaac was the first rank. He, he was the person of first place in relation to the double blessing of the father. And uh, was, J was uh, Jacob the firstborn? Yeah. He was the secondborn by a few minutes. But he becomes the firstborn in terms of the blessing. Was uh, Joseph the firstborn? No, not by a long shot. But he has a prominent place. And so these are illustrations that are used in our notes. Another significant word indicating a personality under the very bottom of page 136 is, is the term logos. And uh, we were referred to John 1 and 1 and John uh, 114 and verse 18. The term logos is translated by the English term word as its basic idea is that of the disclosure, the revelation. I like to think of it as the expression of God's being, who he is. In a comparison of John 1 with 114, here's what that point I was making a minute ago, and that is uh, he was in the beginning. Uh, that's one Greek term to talk about uh, his pre-existence. There was never a time when he was not, but whenever the beginning was, he already was. But then you come to the idea that he uh, became flesh. Now, before you even come to that, just take your English Bible. You guys do have a Bible. Right? These are things you should know, and I think they're really great discoveries if you haven't made them or taken time to notice. But in John 1, <clears throat> So in the beginning was the Word, whenever the beginning was, the Word was already being, and the Word was with God. And it says in our notes here that that with God, or pros, is the Greek uh, preposition, is the sense of, it's a relational term that means that he was face to face in intimate fellowship with the Father. But in order for that to be, he, he cannot be the Father, he has to be with the Father, and in a relationship to the Father. And so one of the things that Logos tells us is that he is the expression of the Father who is, was in a relationship with the Father. 
and uh, that they've always, it says in the notes, have always been two separate centers of consciousness. In other words, they are individual persons of God. There should be no confusion of the two. And so the Father and the Son are not the same persons. Now, let me ask you, if that's the case, then how could Jesus say in John 10, 30, I and the Father are one? What's your answer for that? Uh, the answer is the rest of the verse, in verse 1. Okay. The Word was God. Okay. So does that mean the Word and the Father were one person? No. No. One in nature. Okay. There's one God. There's three persons of God. The first and second persons of God are equally God, but they're not the same person. They're distinct persons, otherwise they couldn't be with one another. They couldn't be in a fellowship relationship. One couldn't be the expression, the logos of the other, but yet they are equally uh, share the divine in the in the divine essence or the everything that's true of God is true of both of them. So you guys remember that from your Trinitarian discussions, I guess. And he says at the end of that paragraph, this then speaks of fellowship, sharing, and exchange. It implies equality as well as association and points to personality. But we're building the idea that there's two persons here in fellowship that are equal but distinct. Not only was he in the beginning with God, but the scriptures also declare he was God, and that's what you just said. The third clause of the verse uh, speaks of the nature of the word. He was of the very essence of deity. Uh, now, theos in halagos, the word was God, has been, as it says in the notes, the target of a lot of controversy and attack. There have been people who say the word was a god, the word was divine. Uh, in our notes, there's all these different type of views that have been people have tried to take. Uh, there's a Greek rule, and uh, I'm a little bit thrown because I thought you had a little bit more Greek background, but it, it, this will not mean a lot to you, but the Colwell rule that he's talking about here has to do with the order of these terms in the Greek language. And it, and it literally says, God was the word. And the word the is with word, but it's not with God. Do you have what I'm saying? If I just put it up here in English, the phrase goes like this. I'm not saying that's a good translation. I'm saying that would be a word-for-word -word equivalent of what we find in the Greek text. But when we have a, a noun here preceded by an articular expression here, and this is the copula, or the word is or was, uh, this is the predicate nominative. And uh, so really it should be translated, the word was God. Why is God pushed to the front of that phrase? For emphasis. Why isn't it articular? Why doesn't it say the God? Which he could have said if he wanted to make this the subject. He could have said the God was the word, but he didn't. By leaving it out, it looks backwards to us, but he's really saying the word was God, and it's definite even without the word the with it, because of this Colwell rule. But being without the article, which is called anarthris, it emphasizes quality, godness. So the word, I mean, godness was the word, is really the way you could think of that. So, so that's the that emphasis to his equality with the Father and his divine nature, but at the same time, not confusing persons. So that's talking about essence there, then? It's, yeah. Would you say that, that the word was the essence of God? Yeah, I would say that's, let's see, is that what he goes on to say here? No, I don't know. I didn't. Um, he, let me just break in about the second sentence in that paragraph, if you're with me on page 137. It says, this is not a convertible statement with either noun capable of being construed as a subject. The article could have been used with theos, or it could have been omitted with logos, had there been the intent to have God as the subject of the clause. God is in the first position in the clause for emphasis. Because this is the climactic statement of a series of remarkable statements. Not only was the word already in existence at the beginning, and not only was he a personal being in fellowship with God, but he was himself God. 
Furthermore, the statement, God was the word, is in direct, you know, if you were to take it and, and actually translate it as God was the word, it would contradict many things that we know to be true. But the Jehovah's Witnesses are ones who, in their New World Translation, actually mistranslate this, thinking that because there's no definite article with this word, theos, uh, that it has to be rendered a God, indefinite, in other words. But the fact of the matter is, though, there is no indefinite <coughs> part of the Greek language. And theos, because it's a proper noun, it would be definite, and also because of its construction here, it's definite, <coughs> even without the, uh, the article the with it. I don't, I'm afraid I'm belaboring things that aren't that meaningful if you haven't had some basis in, in Greek, but does it help? Are you able to kind of see the idea of the arguments? <coughs> and then how, you, so how it'd have to be essence, because you wouldn't want to say the word was the person, <coughs> was the person of God, or would, I mean, no, you wouldn't want to say that. You, you would say it's nature, <coughs> or essence, or... Uh, <coughs> Swain's been making a big point of the essence <coughs> as opposed to the uh, persons. You know, he's been kind of been going, been driving that point quite a bit. Quality, divine quality, or the essence, I believe, would be uh, fit at this point. Okay. Or nature, although I don't like the word nature because it sounds like it better describes a creation than a creator. But uh, we, we run out of words sometimes. So, uh, let's see, where are we? <coughs> And if it did, if it did, was translated, uh, God was, or the word was a God, it would be teaching polytheism. If you could have a God, you could not have the God. You would have one, you would have one of other gods, which of course contradicts everything the Bible teaches. Okay? Um, I, don't, I don't know that I'll be laboring any more in that paragraph. Um, any questions about that? When people translate John 1.1, 1, 1, this one up here, uh, the word was divine. Uh, this is the last paragraph on that page. It is usually with the implication that divinity is something other and less than absolute deity, which, of course, would be wrong. If John had meant divine as the sense of the statement that he had access to word, they eat us. And, and, and although that expressed key is divine, that would have been a true statement, uh, that wasn't his purpose to say that, this, that the word was divine. Because he's not, he's not uh, attributing attributes to the word. He, he is, at this, he's not saying the word was divine. What he's doing is talking about a relationship with the Father. Now, when John 1.14 is compared with 1.1 in another particular significance, uh, is the change of verbs, and I think I've already mentioned this. Was is the imperfect tense, became is the aorist tense. Uh, and there's, he who was already being at a point in time took on humanity. And that's an addition, not a subtraction. Okay, when the Son of God, the eternal Son, came to earth as a man, he added something to his nature. He didn't take something away from him. He didn't stop being who he was or, or lose any of his divine attributes. Right. Now, why do we need to say he added anything? Because we know that he came in physical form, or at least there's, you can make a case he came in physical form before. So, could you make a case he's always had a physical form? Yeah. <coughs> uh, well, in terms of a permanent union of natures, he, he added humanity. These, uh, these theophanies or Christophanies that occurred earlier are, are strange to us, but we have to remember that God who lives outside of time, there's not a continuum that he's restricted to. And it's, it's like uh, these were previews of the incarnation. But once the incarnation took place, uh, there would never, as I understand it, there will never be a time ever that the Son is not united with human nature in a body. And so he added human nature in a way that had not been his nature. So are we careful to say that he added something, not subtracted something, so that we don't miss 
interpreter to sort of apply the kenosis yeah. idea of emptying himself right. and kind of making it sound like he's less than right. what he was. Yeah, that's that's the whole concern there. And the kenosis passage is notorious for misunderstanding because it sounds like you know, but emptying himself sounds like he poured out of himself something of what he was, and actually what it means is that he. Um, subjected what he was to the limitations of human nature. And in that sense, it was an emptying, but it, but it was really a better, it's better to think of it as the addition of human nature. He shrouded his deity, I like to say, with the limitations of humanity, surrendering the independent use of his attributes to the will of the Father, and actually became dependent upon the Holy Spirit, although in the order of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit is third and he's second. But in incarnation, the Son lived just like you and I have to. He lived by the Word, and he lived dependence on the Spirit, which is an amazing thing. Amazing humility, condescension. And then he goes on to talk in that uh, paragraph on page 138 about the term dwelt uh, in, in John 1.14. He can dwelt among us, better translated, he tabernacled or tented among us, with the idea that he lived in this uh, human body, this human human nature, and uh, was right here in our midst. He, he was on display. We were left with no doubt as to what he was like. Okay? He was, he, he exposed himself, you might say, to four years, I think four years of, of close scrutiny, not only by the disciples, but by everyone else. And that's why John says, we beheld his glory, glories of the <coughs> uniquely, uh, unique one from God, full of grace and truth. Always full of both, not pitting one against the other or part of it. And uh, he is the one who exegetes or explains the Father. So if we want to know what the Father is like, we only need to look at the Son. That's why Jesus can tell Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Remember that in John 14. I don't want to get ahead of myself. I'm looking to see if this is a time we want to go to uh, 1 John 1, but I don't think we'd go there yet. But it's kind of interesting when it says in John 1, 14, we beheld his glory, that the idea there in the Greek is that we watched, you know, it's, it's a word that theoreo, we get the word theater from it. It means to gaze at intently for the purpose of making observation, you know. It wasn't that they glanced at him, but it's, a, it's, it's that they gazed at him. <clears throat> and he uh, subjected himself to that kind of scrutiny. Um, I want to talk about the deity of Christ, uh, which obviously has been disputed by, by people over the years. Um, there, is, there are explicit assertions of his deity. Without looking at the notes, can you think of a place that you would go to in scripture if someone asked you what I was asked on a, on a jet ride one day? I, I was uh, on my way to Seattle from Portland to leave from there to go to Russia on a two-week two, uh, mission. And uh, I sat next to this fellow who we got to talking, and he indicated that he was, uh, he sounded like a Christian, and so we began to talk about that. He's, he claimed to be a Christian. But he said that he had a little different belief, and he wondered what I thought of it. He said he believed uh, in Jesus, that he was the Messiah. He said he believed that he was the Son of God. He said he believed that he died for his sins and rose again. That sounded pretty good to me so far. But he said he did not believe that he was... Um, eternal, or that he, he was uh, co-equal with the Father. And he claimed that, uh, that there weren't any scriptures in the Bible that, that indicated that. Well, obviously, you know, I'm sitting here with my mind, you know, my palm's getting sweaty and my mind's racing. I'm thinking, gee, I'm supposed to be, you know, somebody can answer this question. The verse that came to my mind was John 8, 58, where, where Jesus said, before Abraham was... Uh, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. 
And I pointed out to him that the I am statement, ego and me, was tantamount to claiming to be Yahweh, or equal to Yahweh. And the fact that Abraham preceded him in about, by about 2,000 years and he claimed to have predated him uh, is, an, is an assertion of deity. And that is one of the ones that, uh, that we can refer to. Any, any that uh, you like or that come to mind that you use with people? I like the uh, watching him forgive sin or uh, accept worship. Okay. Uh, and those are some things you can make a pretty strong case that those are jobs that are reserved alone for God, yeah. Yeah. as opposed to just one verse that you can dangle. It's right. like a dangle of verse too. I just yeah. like being able to build a case. Yeah, good. And those are some that will come to some of his works and some of his uh, the things that are said about him. Mark, do you have any that come to mind? Verses that you kind of, that, that you would go to to, to convince somebody else or to remind yourself where it says in the Bible. Um, is there something? Why is John 10? John well, 10, right John 10 30. Yeah. Well, which one is it? John 10 and verse 30. Maybe it's the one you're thinking of. Uh, okay, maybe that, yeah, I don't follow one, yeah. Let's talk about that one more. Well, I had purpose. That's what Jones wants to say. Well, they were one on purpose, so uh -huh. you, you get tangled up. That's why sometimes just a, a verse here, a verse there, is open to Doesn't interpretation. Doesn't anybody out. Uh, th that's in our notes at some point. I'm not sure it's right here, but I think there's... actually, if you if you go on, I mean, yeah, we, I mean, we probably need to talk about that verse, but for Jesus of DV, it's kind of like he's saying you read the whole thing, 22 to it's to the end. John 10? Kind of, yeah, yeah. He kind of builds that case. Yeah. When he makes that statement, it's on page 139, if you want to turn to it, and then it's just the next page over, about mm -hmm. the first, the first <laughs> the biggest paragraph on that page. He's uh, talking there, Colossians 2.9 also supports the deity of the second person in that it states, in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead. Theotetes, I'm sorry, theotetos literally means uh, deity or godhood. And this is predicated regarding Jesus Christ. In John 10.30, that's where we're going, the Lord himself declared, I and the Father are one. The use of the neuter, hen, which is the word for one, refers to one thing, and that should be noted. He is careful not to use the masculine gender and thus suggest that he and the Father are one person, but rather by using the neuter indicates common nature. Uh, you say the Jehovah's Witnesses would say one purpose, but... Uh, I would argue that if, if there is a being who has the same purpose as God, he is God. I mean, who, who else can make that claim even? You know, how, how can you be one in purpose with God in, in an absolute sense without being God? In an absolute sense. Because I can say that we are all, you know, yeah. as Christians, hopefully we have the same goals, drives, desires. I think that's as far as they go with that. But when you say absolute, yeah. absolute nature or absolute perfect purpose, then, yeah, you can't. Well, one is absolute. I mean, one's a pretty absolute number. Yeah. And to say there's no, it's, to me, it implies there's no variation in his God's, the Father's purpose, and in Jesus' purpose. That's a good point. And to me, that, if those are concomitant, then he's God. That is a good. I mean, you sense. and I are sons of God, by the way, but we're not the son of God. We're not unique. Uh, we are at one in purpose with God in a intentional. Because it doesn't say he's doing his best. To do everything that God asked them to do, it says that it's exact. That's a that'd be a really good way to respond. Yeah. You could also say, you know, it's a little, it's a little abstract, but if if you and I were confronting an alien race, and we said, we are people, we are one, we are the same essence, we're right. a different essence than you, and then that says a whole lot because then, of course, if they could understand that, they'd know, okay, they're both people, essence, mm -hmm. which is different than us. And probably has a whole lot of purposes associated with it, completely different than another. Mm -hmm. That's kind of the same. Yeah, there's an identity with a class or with a, a where yeah, where we where I would use that word one, but they'd obviously see that we are not the same person, right. but we are people. Mm -hmm. Indeed. You know, I just realized back on 138, uh, a point I wanted to make that we skipped over, and it's in that little paragraph right by the middle hole on your page. It says, one final indication of the personality of the second person to be noted is the fact that he is designated as the image of God. Image. That may sound like, a, hmm, likeness, but not same, you know. But it, what it 
it appears to be the meaning of that is that he that God that God is a personal being and therefore Jesus is the image of God in that he too is a personal being. And we would share that with him, right? Or well the we, same thing we're talking about it like Imago Day. I think it's the same word that is used of us, but Jesus is the image of the Father in a way that we're not. We're the, I mean, I'm thinking now of 1 Corinthians 11 where it talks about God is ahead of Christ, Christ is ahead of every man, and man is ahead of the woman. There's a, there's sort of a, a, a trickle-down theory, but a, a analogous relationship, Father, Son, and us to Him. So you wouldn't want to use this, that argument to... Uh explain to people that Jesus was human as well as I, no, that's the point. I think right. that it, I think I think this word in the context of 2 Corinthians 4 4 and uh, these other passages are indicating his his uh, personhood as a person of God. He is the exact image. I think Hebrews 1 3 says he is the exact image of God. In other words if you want to know what God is like, look at Jesus. Now, you can't say that about me. You can't say that about you, no matter how good Christians we might be. You sh we, should, we are being conformed to the image of God's Son, but, but we are not the exact image. He is. Does that make sense? If you, look, if you want to look at... I don't believe we're ever going to see God the Father. And you can disagree with me, but I think when we go to heaven, we're going to see Jesus in a glorified body, which we will also have glorified bodies. And I believe we will see Him. When we see Him, we will see all that we'll ever need to see of the Father. Uh, I don't envision the Father as being a, uh, in a human body, for example, or having a physical nature and a long white beard and to his, you know, sitting on His right hand on a uh, throne like His, uh, the Son, a little bit lower down or something like that. I think we're going to see Jesus, who is the exact representation of everything that can be uh, conveyed to us about the Father. We, on the other hand, are being transformed into the likeness of Christ, but our likeness is derivative and His is, um, um, I'm running out of words, but His is, uh, is, is the exact express image. Okay. Well, the passage I was going to uh, talk about a little bit, there's, there's several of them listed here, and one of them is Titus 2.13. And this gets into another <coughs> Greek construction, which I don't want to uh, bore you with. I, if you don't know about this verse, it's really a good one. Um, Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. And, and if you take homiletics uh, for expository preaching, this is a passage I have to have the students prepare a sermon from. Let's just read the whole passage. Uh, Titus 2, verses 11 through 14. Do you have that, Mark? Mm -hmm. You want me to read it? Yeah, that's good. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires, to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. These things speak and exhort and reprove with all authority. Let no one disregard you. Okay, now, by the way, just for your amazement and amusement, uh, verse 11, the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation to all men, is, is a reference to the, uh, the coming of Christ and, and kind of looking back at it as uh, salvation in past tense. Okay? Uh, you heard about all this, but verse 12 is really salvation in present tense. Not only have I been saved from the penalty of sin as a result of, of God becoming flesh and, and dwelling among us and doing the work that he did on the cross, verse 11, but he came to instruct us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires to how to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age. Verse 13 is salvation in the prospect of the future, looking for the blessed hope. Okay? It's kind of a neat verse. That's why I like to sign it for preaching. You've got three tenths salvation, past, present, and future. And then in verse 14, he summarizes the whole thing, and you've got all three. Who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed, that's past tense, to purify for himself a people for his own possession, that's present tense, tell us for good deeds, and uh, it anticipates his return. 
Uh, what I want to point out is in verse 13 when it says, our, our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. There is in the Greek here a construction called the Granville Sharp Rule, in which the God and Savior, Jesus Christ, are, are equal, equated grammatically. What is true of one is true of the other. That's a very strong uh, statement of the deity of Christ. Our great God and Savior Jesus Christ are referring in that passage to the same person. Okay. Jesus is God. In Philippians 2.6, Colossians 2.9, these are other great uh, direct statements about the deity of Christ. Colossians 2.9 is, is the one that says that he, uh, in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. Isn't that right? Yeah. So for all the fullness of deity to dwell in Jesus in bodily form, uh, he has to be God. So those are some real strong ones. And then after a, he goes in here after a survey of Greek manuscripts, early translations, and other grammar instruction of the passage. Um, now let's see, we need to go to this. Uh, At the bottom of that page, uh, 138, Paul does not hesitate to call Christ Lord of the living and dead, uh, a Lord of glory, the one through whom all things hold together, uh, to whom all creatures are to bow, uh, all these things that you were saying, Jeff, uh, statements that can only be true of God, Paul, without hesitation, makes them concerning Jesus. All power and wisdom, he represents Christ as pre-existent. Um, being in the form of God, having equality with God, all these uh, references. The, uh, it's actually on page 139 where I got ahead of myself again a little bit. Uh, the Titus 2.13, our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. If you wrote it down, you didn't need to hear this. Uh, this declaration is to be understood as stating that Jesus Christ is God as well as Savior supported by Granville Sharp's rule. And the rule is stated right there in the next little paragraph. Is that that same rule? That's not the Colwell rule. This, this, no. is, a, this is the one that says uh, if two Greek words in the singular are connected by um, are connected by chi and one has the article, the other one is referring to the same person. And they don't need to repeat the article. Right. That does not, however, apply apparently to plurals. And I'll tell you why that's irrelevant. You know, in, in uh, Ephesians 4.11, when it talks about pastors and teachers, Christ, you know, said there to have given some as apostles, some of those prophets, some as evangelists, pastors, and teachers, and you have people like uh, our friend uh, John MacArthur refers to himself as a pastor slash teacher, pastor teacher, because he's he's assuming that the Granville Sharp rule is in effect and that pastors and teachers are referring to the same person. But actually that's a plural, and uh, what I understand is that this rule doesn't apply to plurals. So I personally think pastors and teachers are Two different kinds of people. Big deal. But it's a Greek argument. Okay. So Colossians 2 9, we've referred to a little bit. We've talked a little bit about John 10 30. Uh, uh, let's go to the divine names. In addition to the names of the Son of God and Logos, other names uh, of Jesus Christ indicate his deity. For example, the name Lord. And here we're talking about uh, the, the Greek word kurios which doesn't always refer to deity, it can be the word for sir, or it's kind of like in, in uh, Spanish when you refer to some, if you say senor, it can be, that's the word in the Spanish Bible for Lord, but it's also just mister and sir, and the same thing is kind of true of the uh, Greek word kurios. But when the Greek translators of the Old Testament wanted to bring the, the word uh, Yahweh over, and follow the tradition of rendering it Lord, they brought it over as kurios. So 
there are times when the New Testament is referring, uh, when it says Lord, it's referring to uh, deity for sure. And there's a list of some of these references here. For example, in the Old Testament, the term mighty God, remember that in Isaiah 9, 6? Born to us, a child is born, a son is given, and all the things that will be true of him. The mighty God, everlasting Father. Uh, these are things that are applied to, to uh, Jesus. Is Alpha and Omega another one? The Revelation mm -hmm. one? Yeah. I think that's maybe in here. Uh, read this over a bit. Yeah, that's certainly well, here's. Well, they have it as divine attributes on the defense. Uh, Revelation 1 8, yeah, I think. Mm -hmm. And that's that's what it is the Alpha and Omega. <coughs> uh, let's see. Let's look at 1 8. It's kind of a weird one, that's why I asked, because I've tried to use it before, but it depends on. It gets confusing to try to determine who's talking. Is Jesus talking, or is it a reference to Jesus? So it's kind of a confusing yeah. section. I think the actual reference in the book here, in the notes, is, is referring to the part that says the Almighty, oh, that he's being attributed the uh, quality of omnipotence. But you're correct, the Alpha and Omega is another reference to the Old Testament, you know, uh, reference to deity, and I think you're right on that. Most of these are not going to convince somebody who is, is not teachable, but they're, they're certainly uh, confirming evidences for those of us who, who believe. They're not all necessarily surefire proof to someone who doesn't, won't believe. Let's see, where we, what do we want to do here? Divine attributes of the New Testament indicates that the following perfections are true of Jesus Christ. Eternity, there's the one that I referred to with a guy on the plane, John 8, 58. And I did, I was successful, for what it's worth, in giving him an answer that he said what didn't exist. He said there's nothing in the Bible that indicated Jesus was God. And I said, well, what about that one? And I think he may be still thinking about that. Immutability, uh, Hebrews 13 is where it says Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That can't be said of anybody but God. And we just talked about omnipotence. Omniscience. What's that mean? Um, he knows everything. What's John uh, 21, 17 say? Let's see. Let me look that one up. That doesn't seem to fit. You know all things. Peter said you know oh, all things. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with the argument that says, I don't know the... Huh. I don't know. In Matthew 24? Yeah, I don't know. I even follow your nose. Some will come again. Good question. Let's talk about that. <laughs> your turn. Who's got an answer for that? You know what we're talking about in Matthew 24? There's another day of return. Right. Father does. Right. I do not personally believe that that is a statement that is true of the. Uh, the Son of God in his essence, but it is true of uh, Jesus in that, in the condescension or the uh, limitations that he took on in, in a, in as a human being. That uh, be, because it, that he is God and he is all-knowing and he, he, he was uh, emptied of none of his attributes, I have to believe he knows everything that the Father knows. But he could make that statement in the humiliation of his incarnation because he that's almost a miraculous limitation to things that God the Father wanted him to, to know. Does that make any sense? Yeah. It's, the answer lies somewhere in the mystery of the incarnation and how he, for example, is the Son of God omnipresent? Is he present everywhere? In, in essence, he in is. Essence, in essence, he is. is. And he didn't ever change that. So in, you might say, this gets weird, but in, in uh, God is spirit, so Jesus, so the Son of God is his spirit, and as the essence of God and the spirit, he is everywhere present. Uh, I think we can apply to the Son of God, the second person, everything that David said about, if I go up to heaven, if I go down to Sheol, or anywhere I go, you're there. And that would be true of every single member of the Godhead. 
But in his incarnation, Jesus is not everywhere present. He is where now? He's at the right hand of the Father. He's in heaven. Wherever the Father's presence is, that's where Jesus is. When he comes back and touches foot on the Mount of Olives, where we've been, and it splits, he'll be there then, not, not in California. Okay? He's localized, as I understand it, in a human body that is glorified and is not omnipresent in the person of Jesus, but as the eternal Son of God, he is. Now, that, I, can't, I know that doesn't help you because it, it sounds like I'm saying two things that can't add up. But I believe both of those are true. So. <laughs> you guys didn't just let me off the hook that having done a bad job? Oh, a bad job. <laughs> I mean, I don't know how else to explain it. Who is going to explain to me in Matthew 24? Um, well, because that was one of the questions is... God can't, I mean, excuse me. God anyway. can't die. Because yeah. he's not a man. He's not a physical being. So Jesus, uh, so the Son of God can't die. But Jesus can die. Yeah. John Calvin said there are things you can say about Jesus Christ that you cannot say either about God alone or about man alone. And that's because he's uniquely God-man. So can, can man uh, do everything that Jesus did? No. Can Jesus do things that God, in essence, can't do, like die? Yes. So I think that's the answer is in there somewhere. Yeah, and like a side, a side question that kind of is along that line is Jesus growing up. You know, we knew he was wise beyond his years and knew stuff he shouldn't have known. But, I mean, when he was really little and he had his first teacher, you know, telling him a story about Moses. And maybe the teacher got a detail wrong. I mean, he just raised his hand because it wasn't truth and go, um, that's not right. You know, and the teacher go, yes, it's right. I'm sorry, I was there. You're wrong about this. I mean, did, it was used in a position to know enough to, to correct Incorrect teachings. I mean, things like that. I, I, I mean, what do you think? I think that um, I Jesus would not accept as truth something that was incorrect. So if somebody taught Jesus something that was incorrect, I don't think that he would take that and go, "Oh, that's truth." I think that he would correct something that was. Untrue, but Jesus had. I think he had to learn to walk. Mm -hmm. I think he had to have someone tell him that two plus two is four. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a learning process, but I don't think that he was ever learning things that weren't true. I've never thought about his response to teaching or information that might be an error and uh, being immature and yet perfect. Uh, could he have accepted that temporarily or would he have had to repudiate it? It's an interesting question. Remember J.P. Morton talked about when, when Jesus, I think it was him, talking about when Jesus was you know, lying in the manger, so to speak, and he looks up at the heavens and he's, he's not sitting there thinking about quantum physics or astronomical things, you know, uh, even though he's God. He had to learn and grow. I believe he had to learn Hebrew. What do you think? I would agree with that. I think he, like you say, had learned to, to ride his bike. So to then, then it could be possible he learned um, errors <coughs> in the way that maybe as he got older were corrected by a subsequent teacher. So that's the part I haven't, I haven't uh, ever processed. But yeah, but then, and then at some point, obviously, probably whenever he started his ministry or whatever, then he had. But then, but then, but then you've got his his buddy coming to him going, "I was at home sick today. What did we learn?" And then he teaches what so what to do. We just say the teacher this, said that. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. I, mean, I, don't know. I, I mean, these are you know that's a great point. Oh, man. His parents weren't perfect. No. But he would have learned from them like we did. Yeah, his mother was. Yeah. His mother wasn't perfect. That's right. That's that was she was. Um, she wasn't. <laughs> and so that when you would just think you know having grown up. Hopefully in a night in a good home, uh, but think of the Son of God growing up in a, with imperfect parents who were teed off at him for you know being in the temple when they couldn't find him and so on. 
uh, it had to be a, a very difficult thing for them at times and for him at times. Mm -hmm. but, uh, we, the other interesting thing about that is they knew there, at the very least, they knew if you, there was something pretty that he was some kind of messiah. So if they can't find him, you know, it's weird to me to think because if, if you know you, you're raising the Son of God and you can't find him, it's not really a big deal because he's okay <laughs> wherever he is, he's just fine. But they didn't look at it that way at all. I mean, you don't have any hint of that. No. I think a lot of the things dawned on them slowly over time, like it did with the disciples. And uh, even though an, an angel appeared to Mary and told her basically what, what was going to happen, I think the realizations uh, probably came. Because those, yeah, because life still went on. Yeah. Yeah. And so I can imagine that. I mean, we have that. We have miraculous life-changing events. And then a few days later, we wake up and something the same happens. It's something we think. We gotta go, go to work in the morning and yeah. wash the dishes and clothes. And yeah, and so there, I'm sure that there were just normal days where he was a normal kid. Yeah. Yeah. There's that verse at the end of that where it says, and he remained in subjection to them. Yeah. And Bruin was very in much in favor of God and men, something like that. Yeah. But, which he remained in subjection to them, which, however that worked out, you know, they had to train him up and. I just sometimes wonder who it was tougher on, <laughs> the parents or the child. But uh, it's a wonderful thing that God entrusted his, himself to human parents like that. Um, let's look at divine works. Some of the works attributed to Jesus Christ in the New Testament can only be works of deity. For example, he is said to be involved in creation. All those passages are probably fairly familiar. Without him, nothing was made of Nothing came into being, or whatever. Providence, what's providence mean? Plan. The, the carrying out and fulfillment of a plan and purpose uh, really has to do with the, with God's work behind the scenes to fulfill the purpose of everything that's been created. And he is at work through what's called ordinary providence to accomplish his purpose. Uh, free agents are making decisions all the time, angels as well as, as uh, men, uh, demons as well as good angels. And somehow when everyone will have done everything they're going to do, it will have accomplished what God uh, created it for. But extraordinary providence is miracles. So this, this whole category is talking about Jesus' control of all things. And Colossians 1.17 is where it talks about by him all things consist. Uh, you know, the old song, he's got the whole world in his hands. I mean, he is, he is in charge of uh, the events of, of life for the fulfillment of God's plan or purpose. Hebrews 1 3 again. Uh, forgiveness of sins. Who can forgive sins? Only God. The Pharisees understood that. That's why they correctly understood him, either to be a blasphemer when he proposed to uh, forgive sins, or else he had to be God, which they ruled out as an impossibility because of blindness. The resurrection from the dead. Let's, let's look at this one, John uh, chapter 5. There's a couple things in this one to get. <clears throat> John chapter 5. Um, when the Jehovah's Witnesses come to your door and, and you're trying to keep them on the subject maybe of uh, talking about who Jesus is and whether he's God. And they're telling you he's a God, they're telling you he's an angel, they're telling you he's created, they're telling you he's, uh, they might even say he is God but he wasn't always or I don't know, but I mean, they're going to have some, but look at this one. Uh, they, they believe Jehovah, you know, is Father or the, the, the only God, and, and he, he doesn't share his honor with anyone. In fact, the Bible agrees with that. But look at verse 23, 22 and 23. Not even the Father judges anyone, but he has given all judgment to the Son. Did you know that? The Father will never judge. So that all will honor the Son even as they honor the Father. That's what I'm getting at. Equal honor. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Tell your Jehovah's Witness neighbor, if you don't honor Jesus, you are not honoring Jehovah. Hmm. That's really pretty, pretty powerful. 
verse. They're not, I don't think this is one that they're in, used to encountering. And so it, it, it might give you a, might get their attention a little bit. But then he goes on in this passage that I've used many times at funerals. Uh, truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but has passed out of death into life. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, okay, the Son. And those who hear will live, just as the Father has life in himself, <coughs> so he gave to the Son also to have life in himself. And he gave him authority to execute judgment because he's the Son of Man. So you've got equal honor up in verse 23. You've got you now life. He, he is the giver of life. He's the judge. And then it, it says, uh, Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all are in the tomb shall hear his voice and will come forth those who did the good to a resurrection of life and those who committed the evil to a resurrection of judgment. So the fact that Jesus has uh, the power of judgment and of raising the dead is there. <coughs> kind of did a twofer on that. And divine honor, we just looked at those verses, so it's a three for uh, divine honor. If, if Jesus is due the same honor that's due the Father, I don't think we have to be doubt about his deity. Why don't we, uh, why don't we take a little break and we'll come back and talk about his humanity and, and go through this a little bit more quickly, and then we're going to get into the subject of the Holy Spirit. Okay. Where they would be a wireless router to? Let's be over here again. What? The wireless router, and I'm barely connected to it. <coughs> Well, we're going to uh, continue now talking about the humanity of Christ. And he makes a, a point at the bottom of page 139 that while the liberal wing of Christendom has had a tendency to uh, de-emphasize or denigrate or deny the deity of our Lord Jesus Christ in their zealous defense of his uh, uh, deity, we conservatives have a, had a tendency to downplay his real humanity. And he makes a statement that I want you to maybe think about and interact with. Denial of our Lord's humanity is just as serious as denial of his deity. Why would that be true if it is? Because he's very equal. What do you mean they're equal? They're, I mean, he's, he's both of them. They're equally important? Yeah. He's, the both are true of them? Yeah. <clears throat> well, like, like you said before, your dog can't die, so only if he's human. Can you actually pay for our sins? Mm -hmm. that it's not good enough for him to have appeared human or for him to have just uh, you know, done this in a phantom stage. And so important is this that 1 John 4 basically says that uh, anyone who denies the humanity of Christ, that, that is, if the Son of God actually came in the flesh, is uh, that's the spirit of Antichrist. 1 John chapter 4. Uh, <coughs> Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus is not, does not confess Jesus. And in the Greek that is the Jesus, or this Jesus just referred to as having come in the flesh. Every spirit that does not confess that Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of Antichrist of which you have heard that it was that it is coming and is now already in the world. So this is very important. First uh, John uh, one one through three. Uh, this is a, a wonderful passage in which John is going to say in every way that you can that Jesus was that his humanity was real. What was from the beginning? What we have heard. There's a sensual perception. What we have seen with our eyes, and beyond just being aware of this, uh, visually visually aware of him, we have gazed at him. There's that word again for, for gazing at or looked at. We've touched him with our hands, we've handled uh, concerning the word of life. And he goes into a parenthetical thing here about the life being manifested and so on. We've seen and testified and proclaimed to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. Now he starts up again with a relative clause. What we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also. So we have it on the authority of eyewitness accounts 
that <coughs> this Jesus of the scripture was palpable. He was visible. And over a period of time, the apostles uh, verified his humanity every way that you can. It's a very important point. Now, they were, he was writing all this to refute an error that would later be systematized and known as Gnosticism, which is a belief in Gnosis or knowledge, and a particular kind of knowledge, and that is esoteric hidden knowledge that was thought to be gained only through uh, certain secret rituals and so on. But the idea of Gnosticism is a dualism that Anything that is spirit is good, and anything that is matter or material is evil. And so the Gnostics believed that God, who is spirit, could not have really had contact with the material world, or he would have compromised his, uh, his uh, purity. And uh, so they denied that Jesus it was really God come in the flesh, and believed that he appeared to be, uh, have a body. He had a uh, phantom body, or a, a, an apparent uh, physical nature, but not a real nature. And uh, over on page 140, John refutes this error and thus confirms the genuine humanity of Jesus by an appeal to empirical evidence. We just read those verses. He appeals to the physical senses of hearing, sight, and touch, and then emphasizes the appeal by repetition to verify his humanness. In this strong state in the parentheses there of the humanity, there is the inescapable implication of deity too. The in sarke, sarki, in the flesh, is to be understood as a reference to human nature. So this is not just talking about a body, but it's a body and also a human soul, human psyche, everything that makes a human human. Let's see, do we want to go into this next paragraph very much? Um, toward the end of that next paragraph, uh, where, I don't know if you're able to find it with me, but it says, it is not so much the fact that he has come as it is the character or nature of the one who came that is in view. We're looking now at John, 1 John 4, verse 3. You're there. Every spirit that does not confess Jesus, remember, that Jesus which was just described as having come in the flesh is not of God. But what was being denied here is not, the, not the, uh, the coming of Christ, but whether he in fact came as a physical being, a human person. So I was going to make a point of that Greek uh, there and write it out, but I don't think I will. So... If I confess that Jesus, you know, if I using the right name, is Lord, or, you know, to confess it, Jesus Christ. <laughs> if I say, okay, I, if I use the right words, yeah, Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. It's God. But really, I mean a different Jesus. Right. Then, that, that is not of God. Right. Okay, so, so that... Okay, that That's exactly that, that, you're, you're, you're right yeah, that, that clarifies that a lot. That is the point, and that is that you can believe in a Jesus who is not the Son come in the flesh, and that's not the Jesus that the apostles are declaring. Mm -hmm. And that goes along with the Pauline uh, uh, point over, is it 2 Corinthians 11, where he talks about the we or an angel from heaven proclaim a, another Jesus? Or is that Galatians? You know what I'm talking about? Uh, yep, I'll find it here in just a second. <clears throat> um, verse uh, 4 of 2 Corinthians 11. For if one comes and preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or you receive a different spirit which we have not received, or a different gospel which we have not, uh, you have not accepted, and so on. And uh, I think this is a good passage to keep in mind, 2 Corinthians 11.4, because there is more than one Jesus. In fact, there is, you could say that there are as many Jesuses as there are false ideas about the true Christ. And one of the false Jesuses is the one who came in a spirit and never really took on human flesh. That's not the Jesus of Scripture. You, you nailed it. That's the point.
Let's see, the next paragraph says that, that the divine Son of God became incarnate is the express statement of Scripture in John 1.14. This incarnation was a result of the virgin birth. By the way, I was taught there's nothing miraculous about the virgin birth. That was designed to shock you and get your attention. This, this man responded correctly over here. He furled his brow. It's the virgin conception, folks. The virgin birth was just as natural as any other birth. <laughs> Yeah. It's the virgin conception that's miraculous. So is everyone correct, right? Dr. Cook? Everywhere you find him, right. to have said that. I wasn't. What? What? Everyone is born a virgin. <clears throat> oh, that is an of a virgin. Oh, I, 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 actually, no, it's his birth a virgin. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was like, I have older sister, but I was like, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> that's disgusting. That was awesome. Like, you right. guys have left me in the dust here, but the point is that. Uh, that once the conception took place, there was nothing miraculous about the birth. Okay. Right. Okay. Good point. Uh, just a little trivia there. Uh, one of the things critics have done is said, well, Mark doesn't even refer to the uh, virgin conception. So how could it be an important doctrine? Or, you know, that proves that it's not necessary and that sort of thing. But by that argument, he, he points out in here that uh, Mark doesn't refer to the birth of Christ either at all. So the virgin conception or the birth. Uh, and it was simply not his purpose to deal with it. John doesn't deal with it because by the time he wrote, so long after the others, uh, that was already accepted and known and it was not his purpose to emphasize it. Paul alludes to it in Galatians 4 4, where he talks about at the right time. Go ahead. Uh, I'm sorry, just full of time. Yeah. He was born under the law, and he was born under the law. Yeah. God brought, forth part, this, right? God brought forth this son, born of a woman, born under the law, and yeah. so on and so forth. Uh, he alludes to it. Uh, and he says in the, at the end of that paragraph, furthermore, the resurrection, the sinlessness, and the deity of Jesus Christ also tacitly point to the virgin birth. Explain that one to me, that sentence. Furthermore, the resurrection, the sinless, sinlessness, and deity of Jesus Christ also tacitly point to the virgin birth. Why would he say that? What does that mean? Because they were unique. Isn't he just basically saying no human could do these things unless they were God and no one could be mm -hmm. God unless they were virgin conceived? Is that what he's kind of saying? Yeah. Jesus had to have a unique uh, divine character that he got by virtue of his virgin conception in order for these things to be true. I think that's what they're saying. Now, this is a, a little point I wanted to make, and, and if you're like I am, you probably have jumped to the wrong conclusion on this, and that is, he says, it will be well to note that the virgin birth is not as, what it is not as well as what it is. It is not the equivalent of what Roman Catholic Church calls the Immaculate Conception. Did you know that? The, this, this is a Roman Catholic dogma proclaimed by Pius XIX uh, in 1854 to the effect that Mary was born and conceived without sin. Did you know that? Yeah, yeah. I did. It doesn't refer to Jesus. I always, I always think of the Immaculate Reception, and that, that was uh, much yeah. cooler. Who yeah. was that? Was that Franco, Franco Harris? Harris. 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 Franco Harris. Harris. Terry Bradshaw. Pittsburgh Steelers. Yeah. Great catch. Immaculate Reception. The Immaculate Conception, I, you know, I just kind of used to think, uh, referred to Jesus uh, being conceived of the Holy Spirit, but actually it's a doctrine related to uh, Mary. So, you know, what's interesting about that, do you guys remember being in the, was it the Jewish Quarter? Mm -hmm. And we were at, what's the name of the church, St. Anne's? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what's that name for? I mean, what, that, what was That's that church built? Mary's right? mother. Yeah. Isn't that now, if Mary's mother I didn't know that conceived her immaculately, yeah, then, then we got to have the immaculate conception of Anne, too, right? And you just keep going back and back and back, and there's a little fallacy in that. We'll talk about, in a minute, uh, something I think is pretty exciting, and that is how it could be that a fallible human being could conceive and give birth to, to an infallible Son of God. Because there's a parallel in that concept to how the Word of God, written, comes to us. But we'll, uh, we'll get to that in a minute. 
it, it's uh, the end of that paragraph says it should be noted that it was the human nature that was conceived by the Holy Spirit, not the person, for the person had existed from all eternity. That's been drummed into us a little bit tonight, but it's an important point that Jesus' personhood was not conceived. There's a deep mystery here, but simply his human, his humanity, his human nature was conceived by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit essentially playing the role of the Father, um, somehow overshadowing or surrounding, providing the sphere in which all of this took place. Now, um, I don't know if you've heard this or not, but I did come prepared to document it, but there are, I'm told, documented reports of virgin conceptions, virtual clones of young girls who have gotten pregnant spontaneously without being with a man. Now, of course, there'd be a lot of people claiming that they weren't with yeah. a man and got pregnant. But uh, there are apparently, uh, not a lot, but some recorded cases of this. And what I've been told it is, is that the, uh, the ovum just starts into the process of meiosis and mitosis and all this, the, the, the division, that with a duplicate set of the mother's chromosomes rather than a father providing the other set. So what is it, 23 and 23 or something like that, or whatever the number is. Uh, every one of those documented cases, the mother gives birth to a female um, who is wow. an identical twin of herself. Weird. So if anyone ever says to you, well, that virgin conception is a medical freak, it's a phenomenon that's been, uh, it's, not, it's not unique, uh, keep in mind, in the back of your mind, that uh, it's very interesting that way back in Genesis 3.15, the proto evangel the first glimmer of the gospel, remember that? The seed of the woman. Yeah. Women don't have seed. And yet, even way back there, language was used that would prove to be extremely accurate that Mary produced a male without a male being involved. And that could not have been the result of natural clone. And I think I think you might have brought up an issue that I've heard before that I thought was like this way out there random theory is that sin is actually passed through yes. man. Like, just as sin into the world through one man, you know, like right. that, that, that people have used that as that it is through man that we are genetically predisposed toward sin. Which I thought that's pretty interesting because that you can rewind the tape all the way back and say, ah, there you go. That's how you can. That is, that is an extremely important part of this whole discussion. That's the reason that Joseph couldn't be the father. If Joseph had been the physical father of Jesus, from a theological standpoint, he would have inherited a sin nature that he did not inherit through Mary. Mm -hmm. so now, do we have biblical proof of, of the fact that, it's, that, that that's the case? No. no. Or is it just an argument? No, what's the case? That the sin nature is passed from the father oh. to the child rather than from the mother well, to the child. Pretty good. Make a pretty strong case. From Adam, I mean, the nature is always referred to Adam, never to the woman. That's, that's a, a beginning point that's very important. Uh, original sin was not charged to the first person who actually sinned. Uh, mm -hmm. At least Paul in 1 Timothy refers to, chapter 2, he refers to the parabasis or the transgression of Eve. He, he acknowledges that she overstepped her bounds in, I think, uh, showing and telling Adam about the, the forbidden fruit and in enticing him to eat it after she'd already eaten it. And, uh, but the original sin is not uh, charged to her. It's charged to her head, to, to him who preceded her in the garden and who got the, uh, the commandment directly from God. So that's one concept right there. It's really interesting, I think, if you take that. I don't remember saying that. Oh, I don't think that was me. me. <laughs> oh, sorry. Well, I'll Someone said that here. Sort of beyond me, but it's really weird to think of that, you know, every woman out there, our wives are all capable of having a sinless being. They're all capable of producing a sinless being because they don't pass the sin nature on. No, see, there's a problem with that. Okay. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because we I, we walked right. That'd be the natural conclusion of see, that. See, then 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 let's let's say see that's good because I just referred if it's true I can't say I can't give you times and dates and uh, library references to the documentation but if it's true that there have been a few cases oh, yeah. documented where women have given birth to.
clones of themselves. What's the problem? Why it's wouldn't sinless. those be sinless people? Those girls born to those women. Because she, she was born of a man. Yes. That's it. It's in so there. So why isn't Jesus inheriting the sin that Mary received from her father? Because the half that would be the sinful half from the father. Gosh. How long is that? Well, I, I don't know that we can be dogmatic <laughs> here, but, but what was promised to her was that the Holy Spirit would overshadow her and that the, the holy, you know, the seed would be holy. It would be, it's basically the work of the Holy Spirit that, that causes her child to be without sin, whereas a human, a natural clone, let's say, of a mother today who gave birth to a daughter would have a sin nature from the, so the grandfather. But, but Jesus' conception was sanctified, you might say, or set apart by the Holy Spirit, and that whole process was in the sphere of the Spirit in such a way that he was without sin. That's a very important uh, concept. Now, if you said that Dr. Thompson, my good friend, uh, uh, he gets off the subject and goes other places, but I guess maybe I can do that too. <laughs> Feel free. You got it. Um, let's see. Let's turn to uh, Hebrews chapter 7. I haven't done this in a long time. Let's see if we can do something here that's pretty interesting. Um, when I say turn in the Bible, you guys must have electronic stuff. Yeah. Going. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if you've never seen this before, I hope I can find it so I can point it out. It's pretty interesting. Okay, here we go. Um, you know the argument of the book of Hebrews that the writer is arguing that Jesus is of an order or a priesthood that is superior to that of Aaron. And, and it's uh, the order of Melchizedek who is considered to be of a different order because he, uh, his priesthood was not determined by his lineage. He comes from out of nowhere, he's got no genealogy, and so on. Uh, and you remember, he's the, the one that met Abraham after this war to get Lot back, when Lot had been taken. Am I right about this? And uh, he met Melchizedek and, and uh, paid tithes to him, gave him an offering. You guys remember this from the Bible? Okay. Let's look at verse, uh, uh, Hebrews 7, start with verse 1. If you want to read those first uh, three verses? I don't have a Bible. Oh, you don't. Oh, <laughs> no, 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 sorry. You're I'm busted. I, and right on tape. I appreciate that. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> well, we, 7 1. Okay. We'll, 1 through 3, and then we'll talk about it. Okay, for this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. And to him Abraham apportioned the tenth part of everything. He is first, by translation of his name, king of righteousness, and then he is also king of Salem, that is, king of peace. And just by the way, who blessed who? Who? In verse 1, Melchizedek met Abraham, and who blessed whom? Melchizedek blessed him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Abraham received a blessing from a man who is called the king of peace and the king of righteousness. Okay? Mm -hmm. Verse 3. He is without father or mother or genealogy and has neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling and resembling the Son of God use a priest forever. Now that doesn't mean that he didn't have parents. It just means there's no record of his. And the genealogy of priests was extremely important. Because mm -hmm. that's you had to prove that you were the priestly tribe of Levi. So here's a man who breaks the mold. I mean he's not his priesthood is not based on his genealogy. It doesn't mean he didn't have I, I think he was a real person with a mom and dad somewhere. Mm -hmm. I, I think he comes on the scene and, and fulfills a type of the Lord Jesus. But anyway, now verse 4. Now observe how great this man was to Abraham, the patriarch, to whom Abraham, the patriarch, gave a tenth of the choicest spoils. And those indeed of the sons of Levi who received the pri uh, priest's office have commandment in the law to collect a tenth from the people, that is, from their brethren, although these are descended from Abraham. 
But the one whose genealogy is not traced from them collected a tenth from Abraham and blessed the one who had the promises. So what's being contrasted here is that the Levitical priesthood collects tithes from the descendant of Abraham, the Levites, I mean, from the descendants of Abraham, the Jews. But here's a man who was paid at tithes by Abraham. So he's in a different category, right? He's greater. And that's the next point. But without any dispute, the lesser is blessed by the greater. In this case, mortal men receive tithes, but in that case, one receives them, of whom it is witness that he lives on. And so to speak, through Abraham, even Levi, who receives tithes, paid tithes. Now here's where it gets kind of interesting. For he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. Let's go back and look at verse 7. Verse 9. So to speak, through Abraham, even Levi, who received tithes, that is, in, in, when Levi was born and his descendants came along, their classification of priests all were on the take, right? They were the ones that received tithes. They were paid to them to support them. But here is a reference to Levi paying tithes to Melchizedek. Well, when did he do that? Who was Levi in relation to, to uh, Abraham? Let's do a little bit of our history. We've got, we've got Abraham. You <laughs> know this part. His great grandson. And we got Levi, he's one of the sons of uh, Jacob. So he's a great grandson of Levi. Now, Abraham is paying tithes to Melchizedek. And it says that Levi was paying, was credited with paying tithes to Melchizedek. How can that be? Because Levi was in Abraham's loins. This gets interesting. Here is a man credited with that which his father, his great-grandfather did. It is said that he did it. Do you see the argument? And that says that this priesthood is superior to this priesthood because the man representing this priesthood was somehow present in Abraham when Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek. And that all goes to show that um, you don't, and you don't think Melchizedek is referring to something like Christ or? I think he's a type of Christ, but I don't think he was a pre-incarnate uh, appearance of Christ. I, I don't. But he's a type of Christ who prefigures or who points to the superiority of Christ's priesthood as a class of it, as not based on genealogy like Levi's was. But the whole point I was trying to get here is that people are in their, their uh, there's a seminal headship that's the big word for it. And that is that we were all in Adam when he fell. And we were all, you can all telescope a whole human race back to being present with Adam in the garden. And therefore, original sin comes to all of us through our Father, right down the line. Well, when Jesus is conceived by the Holy Spirit, he is free of a sin nature because while he has humanity through his mother, and the genealogy in Luke supports that, very meticulous to show that he's human. He has all these grandfathers on his mother's side. He, his genealogy on his father's side goes to Joseph for legal purposes, but he doesn't, he doesn't have a genealogy physically through the father's side. He's the son of God. Is that worth doing? Is that interesting at all? Mm -hmm. yeah. But there's a principle, I just want to, whoever, I don't know now what you were referring to or if this was even the same thing. But the concept that things come down to us, uh, our, we get our nature from our father uh, rather than from our mother as far as sin goes. Cool. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, well that was, that was my little diversion for the evening. But I think it's kind of related here. Do you have to believe the virgin conception to be saved? No. Mm, yeah, you would, wouldn't you? We've got, we've got a tie that you have to break for you. One for and one against. Do you have to believe the, the virgin birth, the virgin conception to be, to be a believer? Yes. 
poor guy. You just tipped the scale the wrong way. Now you say no. Why not? Because I have read the oh. right here. What does it say? This doctrine is not vital in the sense that it must be believed to receive Jesus Christ as Savior. But it is vital to the facts of faith. What does that mean? <clears throat> See, I don't know if that would... I don't know. That, See, that's an interesting follow because... If we ask the question differently, I might agree with the two of you. Could you yeah. deny the uh, virgin conception, that is, deny what it means factually to the case, thereby denying the deity of Christ and be saved? Uh, yeah, Would you say that's that? what I, yeah, that's what no. I was going to say. You no, can't. you couldn't deny it, but you might have never heard of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah five I, years old, I'd never heard. Of yeah, it. I, I don't mean to say that when you're asking to believe oh, in Jesus, yeah. it's checklist of all things. By right. the way, right. I don't mean it that way, but I mean that when just just like earlier, we're talking about the Jesus right. that we're talking about yes. here, Jesus. Yes. Right. I would include it into Good. the Jesus that we're yes. talking about. It begs, if you ask the question, you you beg the question that they already know that yeah. they're going to get asked the question. So then, yes, they would have to. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I agree with, with what you're saying. But and, in, some, in another yeah. sense, when a five-year-old, you know, I happen to have had the privilege of being there when, when Mark uh, trusted Christ as a four-year-old, almost five, wow. on <laughs> Halloween night, I think it was. But, uh, you know, I don't think we went over the virgin conception of Jesus. No. And and I can understand how a believer not knowing better not could be say, I, no, I believe it now. You oh, know, okay. I, like, I, I don't think that Jesus was a virgin. You know, not knowing better because they don't understand what it means. Yeah. But Jesus. when you sit down and you plot it out, then you're ending up with a different Jesus because That's of the significance right. of it. That's an interesting question. I mean, you so, know, Trinitarian, Unitarian, yeah. uh, you know. Well, that, that, that's got all kinds of problems because then somebody accepts Christ. And then later on, they get all yeah. arrogant and wise and say, oh, I don't really think I've accepted Christ. But, and I didn't know about the virgin birth at the time because I was seven years old. But now I don't really think that Christ was born of a virgin. I'll see how that could have happened. Gosh. Now what? Now he's a Christian heretic. I mean, he's a, yeah. he's a, a okay. regenerate false teacher. Yeah. But I believe when, if, if you're ever born again, that, you know, to whether be, you want to or not, it's, you're born of God, not of the will of man, not of yeah. the will of yeah. flesh, not of the, you know, you're born of God. And I, and I don't think you can lose that, but I do think you can deny uh, crucial aspects about the faith. And, and, you know, in my in my understanding, Second Peter is talking about regenerate uh, false teachers. Jude is talking about unregenerate false teachers, but there is such a thing as Christian false teachers. They arose from among Israel and they arise in the church. Mm -hmm. But thankfully, we're not saved by our doctrine. Amen? Yeah, amen. We don't have to get a name in theology to, to go to heaven. Amen. <laughs> but what we study in theology matters. Mm -hmm. Or doesn't it, or should we just go ahead? Because <laughs> that way we find out which Jesus. Yeah. Okay, we didn't get to the end, but why don't we change it?